Hi, my friends. Have you ever felt frustrated trying to sharpen a carving gouge? I did. For that reason, I developed this method that is simpler and uses materials that are really inexpensive. Hi, my friends. How are you? I hope everybody is fine. My name is Daniel Villarino. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In the next video, I am going to do a project that is going to combine a little bit of carving and a little bit of wood turning. Specifically, I am going to make wooden spoons for the kitchen, a utilitarian object. Now, the bowl of the spoon, the concave part, is going to be the part where I will be doing the carving. The external part of the bowl, or the convex part, I am going to be doing it by wood turning, as well as the handles of the spoons. Uh, perhaps in the future, if I feel a little more confident regarding this uh, carving thing, um, I will uh, get to do a whole spoon or some other object just by carving. First, I would like to clarify that I am not a good carver. I have little or none experience at all in this uh, topic. But I think there are many YouTube videos that are really good uh, in the internet, so if you are interested in the issue, please go ahead and do your research and learn about the techniques and the, also how, how to sharpen the, the tools. I bought myself a set of chisels and gouges that covers a spectrum that I think will be at least adequate for the purpose of my next video. I will be putting some pictures so you can see how it came wrapped. And in the description, I will put more information about the brand and the link, if you are interested. These tools have been made in China, and according to the company that sells them, the quality control is done in the US. The satchel presentation is nice and seems to protect the tools. Observing the set, I realized several things. First, the great variety of chisels and gouges that you can find. And this is just a mere representation of it. I find this world really fascinating, and I believe that if I get more or less proficient in it, the combination of wood turning and carving opens a great number of interesting opportunities. I know how to sharpen chisels, both straight and skew chisels, so I do not think I would have any problem sharpening the ones in the set. But I never sharpen wood carving gouges. And I can assure you that the process does not have much to do with the sharpening of wood turning gouges. Here, I would like to reflect on an important point. Wood carving tools are manual tools. If a skillful wood carver can carve at a rate of, I don't know, 1 meter, 2 meters, 5 meters, maybe 10 meters per minute, we have to think that a 32 centimeters in diameter bowl, rotating at 1000 RPMs, exposes the wood turning gouge to 1000 meters of wood. That is 100 times more than that wood carver would cut in the same time. For that reason, the sharp edge of a wood turning gouge doesn't necessarily need to be extremely polished and the sharpening wheels work really well with them. However, the edges of a carving chisel or a carving gouge have to be razor sharp. And I can assure you, by the little experience I have in this field, that while cutting with a sharp tool is a pleasure to do it with a bad edge not only is a headache, but it is also very dangerous. Looking at the tips of the set of gouges, I notice that they come protected by some kind of covering, maybe silicone, plastic, rubber, or something similar. It's something I have learned from good turning tools is that they never come from the factory with the sharp edge one wants. A distinction from wood turning tools in which, besides the edge, many times you want to reshape the profile, is that for carving tools, its profile cannot, or rather should not, be changed too much. Maybe the angle, but just about that, I think. After removing the silicone coverings, or whatever is that material, I realized that the edges did not look that sharp, and the tip of the tools many times had irregularities, beaks, and curves that are not supposed to be there. The bevels and the inside of the tools did not seem polished. I tried to cut a piece of wood by hand, and indeed, I only achieved a tear of the fibers and to sweat a lot. 
so I verified that these tools need to be sharpened. I watched several videos about sharpening of carving gouges and I realized that the technique for sharpening changes from carver to carver, although there are a couple of ways that seem to be the most used. One consists of rolling the tool laterally while it is moved over a sharpening stone. The other performs a series of H-shaped figures. I will put in the description a few of these videos showing these techniques. I tried them and, I have to confess, I did not get good results with them. I felt a bit frustrated. So I began to think how could I systemize and ease the sharpening process and I got an idea that was inspired on how some good carvers hone their gouges. I applied this methodology to one of the gouges in the set and here you can appreciate the result. You can see that the internal part of the gouge has a mirror-like finish and reflects the light intensely. You can also observe the same effect on the bevel. There, although it may be a little difficult in the photograph, you can see the reflection of my finger and the cell phone when I took the picture. Also, you can compare on the left the gouge I sharpened and on the right one as it came. For the bevel side and also from the internal part as well. All sharp edge is formed by two surfaces and to achieve a nice cutting edge you need to pay attention to both of them. The gouge I sharpened cuts the wood by hand really well without the need of a mallet and even when the wood is hard like the piece of pear that I will be using for the spoons it doesn't have a problem. So if I achieve this sharp edge using daily use and cheap materials I thought it important to share it with you because if you do not know the techniques that I mentioned earlier, the one rolling from side to side and the one with the A-shaped patterns, perhaps you can do it this way. A very important thing is that once you achieve this edge and the polishing of the steel surfaces, unless the border is cheap by a nail or the gouge falls and the edge is damaged, you will just need to do the honing to keep the edge. And although the sharpening process will take some time, the polishing is achieved in seconds and very easily while one is working, and the carving becomes then a real pleasure. Perhaps you already know, but I am an engineer and I love to do my research for every area in which I enter. So I did an extensive and in-depth research about gouges and chisel profiles and shapes, and I would like to share with you some of my findings. An interesting fact is that there is not a unique standard for carving tools, but there are two or three of them which are the most common. The Sheffield pattern and also one known as the London system and finally the one uh, of the Swiss manufacturers uh, fail. And there may be some other companies with their own standards. Something that is kind of universal, although is that, in general, in the handle there will be two measures, or rather a number followed by a measure. The number refers to the curvature of the gouge. In the figure, you can see a chart in the case of the London Standard, and here it is a part of the chart from the Swiss company FAIL. I asked the company that sells the set that I bought, and they confirmed me that they follow the standard of the Swiss company. In general, the numbers run from 1 to 9, where 1 will be a flat surface, like a chisel, and 9 will represent a half of a circumference. Between 1 and 9, the closer to 1, the more open the curve, and the closer to 9, the sharper it is. There are even some gouges with numbers above 9, like 10, 11, and those in general are U-shaped profiles. And the higher the numbers they get from there, we enter into the V-shaped profiles. The measure represents the width, called the sweep, and it is a measure from tip to tip of the edge, in a straight line. In a straight chisel, the width is easily found, because it matches the edge. But in a gouge, it will represent the cord that you will tend from one stream to the other of the arc of the circumference. In the case of the number 9, that will represent, indeed, the diameter of the circumference. 
The reason why all this is relatively important is because in the sharpening method that I have developed, I am going to use wood cylinders and tubes in which I will attach different grid sandpapers. And the closer the curve is to the one in the gouge, the faster we will achieve the right edge and the less we will change the original gouge profile. In total, for each gouge type, we will need four wooden jigs, a sharpening cylinder, another cylinder with a slightly smaller diameter to account for the thickness of the piece of leather that we are going to use for the stropping, a hemi tube for sharpening and another one, this time with a slightly larger diameter, again to account for the leather thickness for the honing. The gauge I already sharpened was a number 5 with 20 millimeters of sweep. It is an open core and it requires both, both cylinders and tubes uh, to have a relatively large diameter. The one I will sharpen in this video will be a number 7 of 14 millimeters. The curve is a bit sharper. I will begin the process turning both the wooden cylinders and the tubes for the jigs. With the chart uh, I showed before, the one from the Swiss company, I was able to find in an approximate way the diameter for both the cylinder and the tube perforation. I will depart from there and I will adjust as needed to fit the gouge I am sharpening. The sharpening of this gouge is today's project I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to work. I will use a piece of maple to make the cylinder needed for the sharpening. I will use the bedan to reduce the diameter down to around 23 mm. With the skip chisel I refine the measurement and then I will give it a soft sanding just to remove the tool marks. To verify if the diameter is the correct one, I paint the flute of the gauge. I wrap the sandpaper around the cylinder. I place the flute against the sandpaper, making sure it makes contact all along the surface. And then I sand the flute, keeping contact always. From there, I inspect the wear from the sanding. If there is marker along the center, the cylinder is too big and we need to reduce the diameter. If it is even in all the flute, we have the correct diameter. And if, like in this case, the wear is along the center, we reduce the diameter too much and we need to make another cylinder of larger diameter. Do not throw away the thinner cylinder. With just a little work, that one will be good for the honing part. After repeating the process of making a cylinder, I decided to place it with the sandpaper in the vise and test it there. This time the wear is along the whole width of the flute, so we have the correct curvature of the cylinder. For the other jig piece, I took a square section pine piece and I will make there a 23 mm in diameter perforation. This is slightly larger than the cylinder diameter. I cut along the middle so on the fence side I will have half of the perforation. On the other side there will be less than that because of the blade's curve. I press the wooden block with a semi-cylindrical flute in the vise. I paint the gauge bevel and I try to get it to rest completely against the sandpaper and I make back and forth movements to sand the bevel, inspecting every so often to check if I am wearing the metal evenly. If the wear is in the tip, I have the handle too high. If the wear is in the heel, the handle is too low. If the wear is even, then I am at the correct inclination of the gauge. I began with an aggressive 80 grit sandpaper and I worked both sides until I eliminated all the marker. Only then I go to the next finer grit. For each grit I will repeat the process of painting both the bevel and the flute and use as a guide both the semi-tube and the wooden cylinder to perform the sharpening. I 
I am not going to show the process for each sandpaper grid because basically it is the same painting with a marker, sanding until the marker disappears and then sanding with a finer grid I will sand through the grids with 240, 320, 400, 600 and 800 when you reach that level the edge is already excellent and you can stop there and just strop like I did you can keep sharpening with thinner grit some papers but they are not always easy to get when we sharpen the flute in the bevel side we get a white edge or burr and when we sharpen the bevel the burr appears on the flute side that burr is bigger when we sand with coarser aggressive grits for that reason I recommend to sharpen bevel and flute with one grit and only after to go to a finer grit that way we keep decreasing little by little the size of that wire edge and when we finally get to the stropping stage the burr is almost gone however if we do all the sharpening with all the grits just on one side first let's say the bevel then we pass to the flute since we do not touch the bevel again we leave on the bevel a large white edge that will not only be more difficult to eliminate but also can damage the stropping leather do you remember the thinner cylinder? now I have reduced its diameter a little more and now it has a diameter smaller than the one I use for the sharpening of the flute the idea is that when I cover the smaller one with the leather its total diameter will be equal to the cylinder for the sandpaper as we will see when putting the flute against the leather the curvature of the leather and the curvature of the flute are a match With the same idea, I have perforated another wooden block with a drill a bit larger than the one I used for the semi-tube I made for the sanding. This way, as we will see, the curvature of the gauge bevel will match both the sanding block and the new block where I will attach the leather piece for the stropping. I cut the leather pieces to cover both the semi-tube and the cylinder before attaching them I will wrap them with chromium oxide honing compound for the stropping Here you can see the four jigs to facilitate the sharpening and honing of a carving gouge the semi-tube where you put the sandpaper for sharpening the bevel the cylinder for sanding the flute of the gouge the semi-tube with the leather and compound for the bevel and the cylinder with the leather for the honing of the flute
Once the sharp edge has been obtained, to keep it in top shape is as easy as give it a couple of passes in the leather semi-2 and in the cylinder for honing. Ok my friends, there you have it, the sharpened gouge, carving gouge. You can see that both the flute and the bevel are mirror-like and that gives an excellent sharp edge as we have seen in the demonstration before. One important thing is that this method can be applied not only to straight uh, carving gouges but also the ones that have a bend, a long one or a short one like this one. And if you see the bevel is done exactly in the same way as the straight gouge. But the internal part, because of the curvature, you have to work it just in a very small sector, like that. So when you look at the polished area, I don't know if you can appreciate it there, it's just the very tip of the bevel that we have worked on the sharpening and also in the polishing or honing. But that is enough to give it a really excellent uh, sharp edge. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If that's the case, please mark the like button below, make comments, and if you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, please do so. There appears the button to facilitate the subscription. And it will be until the next one. Cheers!